Welcome everybody to the very first episode of Fantastic Warhammer, a podcast dedicated to tell the horrible, the epic, the funny, and the quite silly stories and lore of Warhammer fantasy. My name is Reynolds, and I'm gonna be your lore master, sorta, even though I don't know everything, but I do know quite a bit. And uh, since this is the first episode, let me just quickly explain how this podcast works. So each episode will have a new guest or a returning guest with limited to no knowledge of Warhammer lore, who will then choose a topic for that episode and we will then discuss, you know, whatever topic that may be. Now also just let me make it clear that the goal here is just to get as much general knowledge and have fun about the topic and not to go into every single detail and minute little event that happened. So if you're out there being like, oh, but actually this is not what happened, then, you know, okay, fair enough, leave the comment, but just understand that we're here to have fun and just discuss the silly and funny lore of Warhammer. With that out of the way, let me introduce today's guest, who will now do his best Braveheart impression. Uh, it is Franchise1140, or just Franchise. How are you doing today? Yo, what's happening, guys? Hopefully you're having a great day, and always, freedom! Very nice. You, you cut out at the end, but I appreciate, I appreciate the attempt. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you set me up. I had to give it a bye. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, anyways, franchise, uh, we chat a little bit before, but I just want to ha- uh, wish you a happy new year. Uh, hope hope it was good. Yeah, no, I was a cracking one. Um, uh, yeah, I'm excited. This is a obviously a great start to the year. I'm glad to be invited onto your show. So thank you very much for having me. I'm very glad you decided to join me. I was a little bit scared that no one would be willing to listen to me ramble about Warhammer lore. So it was very nice that uh, a few people said yes. Uh, you among them. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. No, it's a it's a it's a fun topic that's got a a lot of lore, a lot going on, about oh, a lot does. of history. Oh, it does. Um, yeah. Even in its creation and its obviously lore. So I'm I'm excited to learn more. Um, when you when you did message me, I was like that that sounds like a really cool opportunity. Uh, and I want to get involved in that. And hopefully it will be fun. Now, just quickly for everyone who uh, might not know you, how, how how aware are you of Warhammer? Like, what's your experience with it? How how much do you know? So I'd say it's limited, but it's okay um, to a degree. So I've dabbled in a bit of the tabletop, um, just a smidge. My friends actually are really into it, so they talk about it a bit more. Of course, played a couple of the video games, Uh, I really enjoy the Total Warhammer series, so really excited for the third one coming out, which I believe is February now. It was meant to come out in December. I was was ready to crush that over the holidays and was kind of sad when it um, got delayed, but as long as they're going to be producing a good game and I expect them to do that since they've obviously done such a good job with the first two. It will hopefully be for the better, and uh, um, as a verified content creator, of course, I get a little bit early access, so I can play before anyone else. Um, Anyways... (laughs) Anyways, today's topic was not chosen by you, it was chosen by me, despite what I said in the introduction. And the reason for that being that I do want the guests to choose the topic, however, I do also think it's a little bit important we lay down some general information about the universe and how everything came to be, so that if anyone new to Warhammer or unknowing about Warhammer starts watching or listening to the podcast, at least they have an idea of what the heck the different things are. Um, So we're going to be discussing nothing less than about 11,000 years of Warhammer lore, starting at the very beginning of the creation of absolutely everything, and then ending up, well, somewhere. I don't want to spoil it, but we'll end up somewhere. Uh, So I hope you are ready and you're strapped in to listen to me talk a lot. And uh, of course, whenever you have questions or anything you want to comment on, you just uh, go ahead and do it. Yeah, so I suppose um, <clears throat> the first question I really have to ask is, um, so this is going to be, is this the the history and origins of like original Warhammer? Because if I am correct, there is Warhammer, then there's Age of Sigmar. Which yes, I so, so is- Warhammer Fantasy and Age of Sigmar are the same thing, but different versions. And some lore has been retconned and rewritten, but in general, Warhammer Fantasy came first, and then after that, some things happened, which I'm sure we'll be discussing at uh, a later point. Um, and then Age of Sigmar became a thing. Yeah, hopefully I didn't jump the gun there, but that's just... Oh, no, 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 don't, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Uh, I'm gonna start off with a long-ass quote, uh, just to like, get, get the mood going, and this is like... The idea or, or like what people know of the beginning of the universe, not just this 
Warhammer world, but the beginning of the universe. And it is from Techless, a uh, well-known high elven mage. Um, so I'm going to read that real quick. Um, In the moments before the beginning, there was no time, no matter, and no dimension. Only the endless potential for these things. For in the absence of absolutely everything, absolutely anything becomes possible. And so it is that this endless potential realized its own existence, thus creating the universe and all the planes of existence that run parallel to it. As time and matter and dimension swelled in the physical womb of the realized, the potential continued to grow alongside them, within the metaphysical womb of the still unrealized. Every new creation brought with it the possibility for growth and a greater complexity of form and process. In time, creation realized unto itself life, and in life in turn spawned perception, and following perception came consciousness, and with consciousness so followed intelligence, and from intelligence sprang conception, and from that came the words that bind all things into conception. That is a mouthful and a lot of big words, but essentially it means that because there was nothing, there had to be something, because there can't be nothing without something, and when something figured out there was something, it created the universe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of a it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but that sets the the time of the creation of the universe. And one thing I will say right now is that the Warhammer Fantasy Planet doesn't have a name. It's not named Earth. It's not named the old world because the old world is part of the warhammer world so i might say earth i might say the planet i might say the warhammer world i don't know but the planet itself doesn't really have a name just just so that's out of the way you think even when you're like able to finally be aware of oneself you would maybe start by naming it <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely but apparently the uh the universe nah that no need for that we're just gonna spit out a bunch of planets and see what happens we don't know what it is yeah <laughs> apparently all right, wait, I forgot. Sorry, I need to turn on the uh, screen for you to watch alongside the PowerPoint here. Let's see. I was thankfully watching it through the stream. So yeah, 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 but it, we, you, you don't want the delay. You get the deluxe experience of watching it in real time. All right, you in here? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in. Excellent, excellent. So we start off talking about the topic, which I said is about 11,000 years. And as I mentioned, we're not going to go into every single detail because otherwise we would be here for a very, very long time. So we're going to be skipping over a bunch of stuff um, and not going to go into detail about a bunch of stuff, but also go into detail about the important things. Starting off at uh, minus 15,000 years. This is following the Imperial Calendar, I believe, so year zero is when Sigmar is born or becomes Emperor, I forgot, but we're at minus 15,000 years right now. So you're, so he was so egotistical that he's like, this is when we're starting the calendar, when I'm born. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly, because much like you, something called the Old Ones arrive in the primeval and untouched lands of the world. And um, the Old Ones are at the same time the most important characters in Warhammer, both 40k and fantasy, uh, but also the ones that are the least described. So the Old Ones are described as omnipotent, like magical creatures of perhaps a reptilian nature or form. Uh, Most people in the fandom like to call them space frogs or magic frogs, hence hence the Uh image on the screen. And, and these guys arrived in the world and they were like, huh, we can we can do some shit here. And, and these guys are basically gods like they can't delete a planet, but they can do they can do things like they can make continents move and they can spawn races. And one of the first races they decided to spawn was something called the lizard men, which you're probably aware of from the total war games. Yeah, they are pretty, pretty badass. I do like them. They are pretty badass, and they were created by the Old Ones. And the first thing that was created, or the first of the Lizardmen race that was created, were the Slan. These are the guys, the fat totes in the mobility scooters, magical mobility (laughs) scooters. Did they Um, always start off like that, or do you reckon they got a bit chunkier? As they, they do look like I think they got chunkier very, very because it, it, we're going to talk about someone called Lord Croak a bit later. And he is not chunky at all. He is um, quite literally uh, skin and bones. 
to be fair, the rest of them are skin and bones or skin, bones, and muscle. Yeah, I'm not sure it's muscle. Let, let me be sure. Uh, let me be clear about that. That um, pretty sure it's not muscle. Uh, what, but the they were the they, they were the muscly. first the first creatures created by the old ones, and the Slan are like. They're not as powerful as the old ones, but they are very, very, very powerful. Especially the slan of the first spawning, which are, well, the first few slans that were created by the old ones. Following the slan were uh, the warriors, because the slan were meant to be magical casters and leaders and, like, you know, supreme generals, whatever you want to call it, of the Lizardmen army. Uh, but they needed weapons as well. And so the Saurus were spawned, and their primary function were to be, you know, living weapons. Uh, they do have, like, mild intelligence, but their primary thing is to, you know, form ranks and run at things and, and kill it with efficiency and power. Question then. If yeah? they are the first sort of species created, who are they fighting? Just one another? Uh, so we'll get to that in just a second. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, okay. So, after the, uh, Sor or so after the Slan came the Saurus, and after the Saurus came the Skinks and the Croxagores. Now, in a uh, Lizardman hierarchy, the, uh, the Slan are, of course, at the very, very, very top. Like, it's no questions asked. There's probably, like, if you have a, a, a pyramid here, uh, what do you call it, um, uh... You know, uh, it's a power... Like, like chain of command. Exactly, like exactly. That. There's like, um, the, the, the Slan take up like five, five, five slots of command, basically, before <laughs> they go down to the Saurus. Uh, and then after the Saurus comes the Skinks, and then at the very bottom are the Croxagores. So if the Saurus are living weapons that are like slightly intelligent, not super intelligent, but you know, slightly intelligent... Uh, the Croxagores are living weapons with basically no other purpose than to run at the enemy and just tear through them in any way possible with raw force and, and like chopping them down and beating them with their giant hand fists and, and stuff like that. Okay. Every time I see a skink though, I always get really mad just because of playing Blood Bowl. They are just nippy wee things. Oh, Just okay. I, I, I can't comment on that. Again, I, I don't really know much about Bloodborne, so I, I wouldn't so, be able to tell. They're just small and rapid and really hard to get your hands on and just score it nowhere. <laughs> that does sound like skinks, because that is also like their primary. They are also part of the armies, of course, and they do fight, but they are yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah. the nimble infantry that goes around or scouts areas and stuff like that, while the uh, the Saurus are the uh, the main fighting force. Yeah, or as Grace pointed out, the meat shields, while you're focusing on them, you're getting chipped in the side. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so you were asking, what, what were they fighting? What were they doing? Well, um, the old ones are uh, kind of racist. Because they came to the world, and there were a bunch, by the way, there's a bunch of races already living here. Like creatures and ah, okay, races okay. and things like that. There's a bunch of them living there. So and some of, of them... Like natural grown... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, born and raised. <laughs> um, Out of um, years and years of... Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and some of them were Evolution. deemed acceptable. I believe something like giants. I think giants were... Like, they weren't created by the old ones. They were a race that was already there. And they were, like, deemed acceptable. Uh, so they got to live. But a bunch of other races did not get that treatment from the old ones. <laughs> uh, they're not named, so I don't know exactly what they are. But... Uh, They're the not old ones. Being named. They, the, yeah, there's no need for them to be named because they got fucked. Oh, they got fucked. Um, so the the old ones and their armies of lizard men started going around the world and just cleansing it step by step, taking care of all the races and just making sure that nothing that they deemed um, not wanted was on the planet. <laughs> Moving on. We look at the world, and uh, as you can see right now, this is how the Warhammer world also looked. This is not the Warhammer world, this is uh, an image of uh, Pangaea, or how people at least think Pangaea would look, which is the supercontinent, and Warhammer was in the very uh, same state. It was just like one big continent with a few small, smaller islands uh, every, every, uh, every now and then again uh, around the world. And the Lizardmen were like... They're not just in Lustria, so you probably know them as being the jungle, you know, lizard men. Uh, yeah. at, at this point in time, they are like basically everywhere. They they're not they don't cover the map, but they have like outposts more or less everywhere. And they have they have temple cities. The uh, come again. I can imagine them staying away from the poles. 
Kinda. Funnily enough, the polls are actually some of the more important things. We'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, they are like everywhere. They have these huge cities called temple cities. And with the technology and magic of the old ones, they're able to teleport between the different temple cities. And they can also connect their cities through, um, I forget the name of it, but it's like uh, like a magical whatever thing in, in the, each city. They can like connect them and let them talk to each other and communicate and also, in this case, teleport. Um, and some of the names of these, I'm going to butcher these names because they're like, you know, Lizardmen, uh, Aztec language. Uh, there's Slakstan, Quatsa, Slatan, and the very first and probably most important temple city of them all was Itza, the deliverer of pizza. Huh. So as someone who doesn't know any better, I think you crushed this, the pronunciation of all those words. So thank you, thank you. I am, I, am, I am very sure that everyone agrees out there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, but at this time, the, the world looks like Pangea. And then for some reason, I can't quite tell why. I may have skipped over it. But for some reason, um, the old one says, we don't like this. This, this is dumb. Why is it, why is it one continent? F no, fuck that. So they split it up. They straight up just split up the planet and move the continents to different parts of the world. Because that's, they can do that. They're like, they're all powerful, right? Yeah, or omnipotent, basically. <laughs> eh, just change up whenever you feel like it. You exactly. have the power like, the ability. It's like me, every year I move around furniture in my room, not because I need to, but just because I like, I, I want to have some change. And I, I assume that's the same the thing that the way. old ones were getting at here. They're just like, yeah, you know what? One big continent, kind of kind of lame. Let's let's split it up a little bit. And so they I did. We were just like, um, oh, I wonder if we just like move all this. Let's just see how they react. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Like, yeah, they're, hmm, they're just let... like messing with all the, the races and people. That could totally be it. Planet. Um, one thing that is made clear, however, is that this would not affect their efforts of uh, killing off other races they didn't like because of the teleportation magic. So at this point, as I said, we still uh, we still have lizardmen like basically all over the world. Um, but the biggest part right here is that they're on Lustria um, and they are in the Southlands, which is like Africa over here. Oh yeah, I should mention, if, if, if you're not aware of the Warhammer world, if you look close enough, it looks very much like the real world. You have North oh, America, yeah. South America, so, uh, Africa, Europe. I see Iceland. Yeah, Asia. And then you also have, you know, Atlantis. Uh, just thrown in there for good measure. Yeah, why not? Yeah, exactly. So, just curious. Did they also decide to make the world flat? Or can you actually go... Oh, that's actually a good the question. I, I, don't, I don't think it's flat. But as you can see, there's something called the Chaos Wastes that kind of like surround everything. And you place uh, to dump your rubbish. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. So if you dump the rubbish there, <laughs> know, it know, mutates and come back to kill you. <laughs> you don't want to dump your rubbish there. I just heard they're really that's, good at recycling. That's a horrible idea. Uh, we'll get back to that later. Uh, but they split up the world, but that did not uh, impede their efforts at anything because you, they could teleport, so it didn't really matter. They could just send you know their armies wherever they needed to be uh, between the different temple cities and stuff like that. Um, at this point, they also create something called the Polar Warp Gates. And the Polar Warp Gates, again, I should probably have read a little bit more into it, but they basically serve as giant transportation, teleportation things. Um, so they're, they're described as in space, because apparently the old ones also have them in space. They're like the size of, you know, a city, the, the, the Warp Gate. Um, and that's for them to teleport. For example, let's say they needed more materials. They'll take a moon and transport through the warp gate. And then, boom, there's a moon. And they can take materials from that moon. As, as you do, eh? Just casually. As you do, as you do, as you do. And they no created the polar... Moon. I'm on it. I'm going to take it. <laughs> and they, they created the, po the polar warp gates. Human. Sorry? They sound very human. Oh, I want that. I'm going to take it and use it. It's, it's, I don't think it's like they want it. It's more like, okay, we need this. Let's just go ahead and use our giant space teleportation devices. And like, boop, here they are. We can use it now. Someone might have been using that moon somewhere. Yeah, but again, the old ones, like, they kind of treat themselves like gods, you know, exactly. playing, playing, choosing who can live and who can die, and kind of just, you know, doing their thing. Um, they create those. They're not super important right now, but they will be later, so I just wanted to mention it. And the last thing, so not only did they, like, just change up the continents just to say, fuck it, they also created the World Pond, which is, like, the water that separates uh, North and South America 
from the rest of the planet. And that makes me wonder, like, was there just not water on the planet before? How, do, how does that work? Imagine there would be water around the continent and it wasn't just all land. But like, right, but if, if they true. created the Great Ocean, which is like, you know, the whole part between North and South America and Europe and Africa, there, there was a limited amount of water on the planet. <laughs> You could have cut it in half, whatever was the original continent. Yeah, I imagine maybe that's what happened. Maybe they didn't change up the continent. Maybe they just split it in half and like, all right, we need to pour some water in here to fix it. <laughs> maybe they <laughs> to just like make everything stabilized. Who, who was controlling what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but that's what they did. And during this time, they also created some new races. And three of those races were humans, elves, and dwarfs. Now, classics 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 exactly how can you have a fantasy setting without these guys um and as time would, would tell these guys are also uh quite problematic uh in any case so with the lizard men the old ones created them and like raised them and gave them purpose and said you are supposed to be doing these things you are like the executioners of our great plan and and the great purpose um but with the elves the dwarves and men they kind of just created them and they're like, we will let you evolve by yourself. We will put you in places where you will like thrive and have like, you know, the right resources and possibility to evolve. But we will not really interfere with you and we'll just let you do your thing. And so going back to the map right here, uh, the elves were placed on Ulfuan right here, Atlantis. Uh, the humans were placed in like most of Europe uh, over here. Uh, it's called the Empire in Bretonia now. But right then, it was just, you know, it was just a place. And the dwarves, they were kind of, like, spread out a little bit around the mountain edges and, like, the Darklands and the Southlands. Kind of just, like, alongside the mountain, more or less. And so, I'm so unsurprised and then they got chucked in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh. So, so just to reiterate, right now we have, there's some unwanted races probably still roaming around everywhere. Um, but we have lizard men, which are basically everywhere in the world. Like, they're not in huge numbers or like conquer big places, but there are temple cities everywhere. And then we have the humans in Europe, the uh, elves in Ulfwan. Um, and then we have the dwarves. It's not described perfectly, but it's just like around the mountains or like close to mountains, stuff like that. Uh, and they were like, yeah, they were left to their own devices and just like, you know, go ahead and, and do your thing and uh, we'll try and see what happens in, you know, 5,000 years <laughs> and we'll come, we'll check back in and see how it's going. Have a, have a fun time. Uh, we'll be back shortly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. We're, we're going to go party and do your thing. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and kill some more races we don't like and then we'll, we'll yeah. see what happens. Um, however, uh, everything was going pretty well for the old ones, all things considered. Uh, I don't exactly know if they had a 100% sure idea of what they were doing, but whenever they decided to do something, I mean, their Lizardman army could handle like 99% of everything. So, uh, it, it went pretty well. However, there was, um, there was one thing they couldn't quite get under control. Um, fungus. What a fool. Do you um do, do do you know the deal with fungus and Warhammer? No, absolutely not. No, I'm clueless with that. Um, so there's these things um called the greenskins. I know the greenskins at least. Orcs, goblins, scratchins, all that kind of thing. Um, they they're fungus. Oh, huh. the, they're the a little li they're fungus. little they're little mushroom people, um and. The old ones, when they created the lizard men and the elves, the dwarves, and men, also noticed that like a new species popped up, but they didn't create them. At least they don't think they did. But they don't know where they came from because they weren't here before the old ones came here. So it was kind of like a big question of like, what the hell's going on here? What, what are these things? Um, and of course, the old ones being racist as they are, they didn't create them, which means they have to go. They can't be here. It's not okay. Okay, oh, that makes sense. Um, so they went to war against the Greenskins. However, as, as Fungus and Spore, it turns out they're really fucking hard to eradicate. Like, you can get rid of most of them, but they kind of just pop up somewhere else at some point. Yeah, you got 100% eliminate them. Um, so, 
Oh, wait, I, I forgot I included this image. <laughs> I was about to say, there are no female orcs, except for these Blood Bowl models that were created in like 1960 or whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Alright, anyways. Are, they are interesting. They are interesting. Oh, uh, no, but my, my point was that, that uh, the orcs are spores, and so they grow underground, and they can't really be completely eradicated. And the old ones, or space frogs, were like, fuck, we, we can't kill them. Because every time they killed, let's just say, 100,000, like, 150,000 would pop up somewhere else. And I'm a bit unsure about this. I can't say for sure. But I I think the thing is, they... So it's the orcs and the goblins, they give off spores all the time. That's the idea. Like, at okay. all times, they give up, uh, uh, pop off small spores. And these grow rather slowly. But the more orcs and goblins are in one place, the faster the spores, like, you know, get spread. And also the faster things grow. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea is... And because, you know, orcs... Uh, thrive in war like that's all they want they want to fight yeah, they want to go yeah. to war uh, so they gather in these huge numbers when that happens and so whenever you fight a war against greenskins you might be able to stop that army but at like at some point the, like the whole army or more is going to come back because they just had a bunch of spore spread I was just saying it's obviously not only they're gathering loads of together but they're also like just spreading out onto as much land as they can yeah exactly they just same point. They don't like have a home. They just go wherever the the freak they want and just go to war and fight. That that's the whole purpose, right? Um. So yeah, the old ones they they just couldn't handle it, and they're like, okay, you know what? Screw it. We 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 fight we fight wars against them all the time, but we can't eradicate them. They're not worth our time. We're just gonna let them exist. If we see them, we're gonna fight them, but we're not gonna like chase them and and try and eradicate them. And yeah, so Hold like them. you know. You mean essentially just trying to manage them? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's the kind of thing like, all right, uh, we're we're so tired of fighting these, and we're not getting anywhere fighting them. So instead of spending time and resources doing it, we'll just you know we'll just deal with them when they approach us. But we're not gonna like go chase after them. Okay, um, so I mean, again, ninety nine percent success rate for the old ones. The orcs, like they represent maybe one percent of all the things they couldn't accomplish. Um, you know, that's fine. Um, one really annoying percent. <laughs> one really annoying percent. And unfortunately, we're about to enter uh, uh, another about 85% um, uh, of unsuccessfulness. Because something happened. Something really bad happened. Something catastrophically, cataclysmically, apocalypsely, uh, world-endingly bad happened. Uh, remember those giant portals I talked about earlier? The polar warp gates, yep. um, they collapsed, and nice. uh, when um, when when these polar warp gates collapsed, they caused a rent in reality to be opened. So like like a portal to a different dimension or a different universe, if you if you will, uh, a different realm. And uh, <clears throat> uh, knock knock, who's there? Uh, demons. Nice! Who doesn't like some demons? Chaos demons! Uh, <laughs> we don't like chaos demons. That's, we don't that's where I like, the line. We don't like chaos demons. And this was a big fucking deal. Because the old ones, they were like, Oh fuck, this is bad. This is really, 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 really bad. Uh, and this is not just like, you know, a few demons popping up here and there and whatever. No, no, no. This is a full-on demon invasion. Like, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't have exact numbers or, or anything like that, but I imagine uh, a, a decent amount of, let's just say, 50% of the world now covered with demons. Something like that. It was just swarms upon swarms of different demons and monsters and monstrosities. And the old ones were just like, hands on their heads, not like this. Uh, couldn't handle what was going on, and and they just they just panicked. Oh, they panicked so so badly. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the realm of chaos. We will talk a bit more about it. Uh, but it's a big deal when this number of demons break through. It must have been overpopulated because they're like, wow, we're we're we've got too much. We've not got enough space here. Let's let's go through this door <laughs> doorway and see if there's more space for us to live and more food to eat. <laughs> So it's not quite like that, because demons aren't actually physical beings. 
Um, demons okay. are magical beings. They're not ethereal, but they are made of magic. They don't need sustenance outside of magic itself. Okay. And uh, that's a big deal, as we'll later uh, come, come into. But the collapse of the polar warp gates, which used, you know, a heavy amount of magic, um, they just, like, kind of oversaturated the Warhammer world with this magic. And so the demons were, like, just able to come in in untold numbers. Has it ever been spe um, discussed how the portals collapsed, or is it just all speculation and left um, to each I think person? it's mostly speculation. I've, it's described as either um, either manipulation of the Chaos Gods, because, you know, when you, when you teleport in most fiction anyway, you go in one place and you end up another place. But in between, you have to, like, go somewhere. Mm-hmm. And, and in this parallel universe, uh, chaos lurked. And so the idea is the more the, the portals were used, the more chaos was able to, like, you know, tinker just a little bit with the, the portals. Yeah. And so over so, time, they, uh, they, they made them collapse. Yeah, so they were almost... They are attracted to the, to the magic as well, so it definitely would have got their attention. If they can eventually break through and consume it, then they will. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that that's uh, that that must be it. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, they break through demons, magic, chaos. Everything is going to shit. Everything is just absolutely horrible. Um, Mate, the old the, ones are really bad at world creating. The old ones are like really bad at, at when when things go wrong. <laughs> they are really really bad. Um, the lizard men muster their greatest armies ever witnessed. And, and go to war against the demonic invasion. But Temple City after Temple City, just they keep falling. Uh, much like the Greenskins, every time they kill off one army of demons, two more appear uh, on the flanks. Or whenever they, they, you know, whenever they secure a city, they have 12-hour breaks before the next invasion comes. Um, so things are going really, really badly uh, everywhere across the world. Uh, the lizard men, of course, being you know the children of the old ones, they see this as their duties, right, to protect the world that their creators created. Um, but they are just—they are not. They are not able to handle what's going on right now, and and things are just really, really horrible. Old one should have made them bear. <laughs> <laughs> they, they seem really terrible at their job. Uh, like you literally had one purpose, and so far two things have spawned that you needed to control, and uh, you shot the bed. I mean, I mean, but but they also handle a bunch of all the races they didn't want. You know, you got you got to remember that. You got you oh, to yeah, remember that part. Weaklings. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, anyways, uh, the elves on Ulf One, we haven't heard much about them, but uh, like they they advanced fairly quickly. Like, they, they started making armor and uh, became poets and learned magic and all these things fairly quickly. Um, so they are, like, like probably on the level of lizardmen at this point, at least in terms of uh, society and power. Um, but they're also fighting off demons. And, oh boy, they are not doing a good job of that either. They are <laughs> really getting slaughtered over there. Uh, it is described as, like, they are nearing the brink of extinction uh, during this fighting. Oh, I should mention, by the way, I completely forgot about it. Uh, talking about what, what's the, the timeline and where we are in the story right now. So we started at minus 15,000 years, right? Yep. Then there was the creation of the elves, the dwarves, and men. That happened between minus 10,000 to minus 6,000. Okay. Um, then the greenskin invasion that happened also around the same time uh, mm -hmm. during the creation of all the other races. I imagine a couple of thousand years, and thousand years later, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, spores grow. Yeah, exactly. They, they, it's just like, that. that's when they appeared. But when they become yeah. a problem, it's not quite clear. Um, and then the collapse of the polar gates happen at around year five, minus 5,000. So the elves, humans, and dwarves, they've had about, about 5,000 years to develop and, and become, you know, people uh, or a civilization. Definitely helps the elves that they can, um, they live for so long that they actually yes, get to advance Yes, yes, absolutely. That. Uh, I actually think I think they don't die of old age, uh, elves and Warhammer. I'm not 100 percent sure on that one, but I don't think they die of old age. Lucky them, eh? Uh, anyways, they're getting fucked, like absolutely obliterated, absolutely destroyed, and it, this is happening all across the world. Um, they they funnily enough they don't describe the humans, and because of what happens much much later in the story, I believe the humans are still in like a very primitive state right now. Like they've had five thousand years, but they need like a solid another five thousand before they become 
you know, uh, medieval times kind of humans. Um, so they're not really described, but yeah, the lizard men are getting fucked, temple cities are falling, Ulfwan is like constantly fighting for their lives. Uh, <laughs> it's like it's like that meme where like, mom, come pick me up, I'm scared, but there's no one to come <laughs> pick you up. Uh, because they're on that island, they have nowhere else to go, they just have to fight the demons. Uh, and the dwarves are also, like, they're using their, their mountain fortresses to try and, like, hold off the demons, and they're not doing a great job either. We're just gonna stay home and close our doors off. Yes, yes, stay home for the absolute best. Um, and everything is just getting, yeah, really destroyed. During this time, when the first, like, chaos, uh, race or chaos demons arrived in the world, uh, the old Thanos ones... was human. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the old ones did, like, one last... One last attempt at creating a race. And those were the Ogres. You might have known them for the uh, Warhammer 3 trailer. I'm not sure if you've seen that. No, I, well, I, I saw a while back, but I don't think I've seen it in a wee while. Like, Alright, well, there's a new trailer when they got it uh, announced as a pre-order bonus for uh, Warhammer 3. Oh, cool. Um, anyways, the Ogres were like this half giant half human race they're not quite giants but they are much bigger than a human i think they stand like uh two and a half three meters tall something like that and they're really they're they're thick they're like they're real thick big boys big boys uh and the idea is that these were created to like counteract chaos however before the old ones could kind of like finish their creation the chaos invasion had become so bad that the old ones, they just didn't have time to finish them. And so they ended up being what they are now, which are kind of like, they don't really care about anything other than earning money and getting fat or e and eating stuff. Uh -huh. um, so we'll get back to them later, but I mean, they were created during this time. Uh, they didn't, so they the didn't do, is, they, they didn't do jack shit, but they were created. The question is, is if, if chaos are um, a delicacy, then they'd probably suited for, suitable for their purpose. Just depends on if they're tasty or not. Right, but Imagine remember, they don't have physical forms. Oh, oh, oh. They're made of magic, oh, right? It's like, uh, they, have, like, they have physical forms you can cut into with a sword or stab them yeah. with, but it's more like, I don't know, magic-given flesh, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, when you kill a demon, there's no corpse. It just, like, poof. Yeah, I get you. I get you. Um, so, that, that's what I'm like. I, they were supposed to counter chaos somehow, but in the end, they kind of became the opposite. Um... They're not, no, not the opposite, because the opposite would be chaos, but I don't know. The, the, the point is, they were created. And they sound useless. Yes, more or less. More an inconvenience than anything. Um, perhaps? Uh, yeah. Um, so, the fighting's going on, and to be clear, the fighting takes place over about 1,100 years. So, 1,100 years of constant fighting for the Lizardmen and the High Elves and the Dwarves and whatever races else might be, might be fighting them. Um, and at this point, the elves are on the brink of extinction. Like, really on the brink of extinction. They are holding on to the last few, you know, large uh, cities and stuff like that. And the lizardmen, they aren't doing quite as well either. Um, so they come up with a ritual. The elves do. The elves do. And it's not quite described what this magic ritual uh, does. But it makes it sound like the idea was to push back demons by, like sending them all to the, the, the poles. So the South Pole and North Pole where the polar warp gates uh, first crashed. Okay. Um, and they're doing this like... The way it's described, it sounds like they're doing this ritual while they're defending the city, right? So it's like, hold the fucking... Hold the tide... Hold, hold the chaos tide back right now because if we don't, we will be like exterminated. We will be gone. And the, the elven mages are casting their spell, and it's like, it's a risky spell. If it, this goes wrong, it could very well just, like, detonate the entire uh, island of uh, Ulfwan. Um, and the, uh, the Slan are really powerful magical beings. They're, like, really in tuned with the winds of magic. So they, they're able to sense when, when big things are going down. Uh, and they sense that the elves are doing something. And, I mean, I suppose they, they're like, you know what? That's, for an elf, that's not a bad idea, the, the ritual they're doing right now. And so they cast their own power, or add their own power, to the elf's ritual. And luckily, for every living being on the planet, they succeed. So they cast a ritual, and they banish the demons back to the north and the south poles. And those become known as the Chaos Wastes. 
This is where the old ones are like, Ugh, I knew we build, created those elves for something. Yeah, uh, except they already left. Who left, sorry? The old ones. Oh, they were like, fuck this shit, I'm out. Exactly. The space frogs saw chaos, started creating ogres, didn't have time to finish ogres, and said, you know what, uh, we'll, we'll start over somewhere else. Uh, peace, we'll <laughs> see you later. Um, Good luck, guys. And they just leave. They just straight up leave the planet. They don't. They're not like they don't give instructions to their uh, to their races or anything. They're just like, nah. You know what? Screw this. Uh, I can't be bothered. We'll 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 try over somewhere else. A for effort. It's time to execute better somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Um, and that's why that's why I said at the beginning that the old ones are at the same time the most important characters, but also like the least described characters in in the setting because they start like they create everything they are the cause of everything but at the same time they they piss off like 5000 years into the, the world's history and they never come back so the uh, ticket this is I was about to ask that is this about minus 5000 this is uh yes so this is the during the uh, the chaos war which happens between or like the great disaster i think it's called uh, between minus 5,600 and minus 5,500. It's a big disaster, I suppose, so pretty yeah. name for it. <laughs> but for now, there is peace. You know, uh, the demons have been sent back to the chaos wastes, and things are, well, slightly peaceful at the very least. Um, you along for a bit. Yes, exactly. Uh, and the Lizardmen are now entirely... Oh, I completely forgot to mention that. When the polar warp gates collapsed, the Lizardmen lost the ability to teleport between their temple cities. Um, that makes so, sense. So each temple city kind of became isolated and, like, they had to defend themselves. And they couldn't communicate either because Chaos was, like, so in the world that the magic couldn't really be stabilized and used for communication. I um, send off a wee message and Chaos is like, ooh, dinner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and... and and um and so the Southlands, you know, in the, the South Africa part of the world. Yep. There were lizardmen there too, uh, but they lost contact because, you know, they couldn't they couldn't speak to the rest of the world or the rest of the lizardmen mm -hmm. race. So all contact uh at this point between the lizardmen now in Lustria, because they they all the lizardmen fell back to Lustria during the uh, invasion. And uh and the Southlands are completely lost. They don't know what's going on between each other. They just keep on doing what they think is right. Yep. And Probably the Lizardmen in Lustria be. start turning the jungle into, like, a fortress of deadly traps. And, like, it, not just against demons, against anything. If anything wants to enter Lustria, they have to go through, you know, uh, poisonous snakes and giant dinosaurs and salamanders that spit fire and everything they can put in the jungle to make it less easy to get through, they do. So what you're telling me is they created Australia. Yes, they turned Lustria in straight up into <laughs> Australia. Uh, and, uh, and and they go, they fall back and they do that. Um, for the elves, they start to rebuild and, you know, things are good or better, at least, than, than they were before. Uh, and, you know, things aren't as bad as it was before. We're now in the year 5000, by the way. Sounds good. Um, moving on. We are now going to talk a little bit about the dwarves. Just a little bit. So the dwarves also lost a lot during the onslaught of chaos. But they also start to rebuild. And they start to settle like the entire mountain range of what is known as the World's Edge Mountains. And that is the stretch that go like straight down the middle of, you know, Europe, Asia, Africa. The big range of mountains you see there. Isn't this the total Warhammer 1 map? Uh, it is. Similar. It is. This is so the old world is like up here, and then you have Southlands down here, and Darklands over here. So the Darklands are not actually in the game. Uh, I guess a little bit of them are, but not like entirely. Yeah. And I, I suppose Cafe is supposed to be on the other side of these mountains, but um, Cafe actually. So it's gonna be in Warhammer Three, but they're not like they're described in the lore. But they didn't really have, like, models or a big backstory, anything like that. They're just, like, they exist. I think they were created as a, if we want to make a new race or a new faction, we can do it in Cafe. Right, anyways. Um, the elves, oh, not the elves, the dwarves, <laughs> the dwarves settle 
the uh, the mountains on the World Edge Mountains. And so, like, they still belong to Europe, but they also go down to Africa, and, you know, they're, like, basically all over the, um, the eastern hemisphere of the world. Yep. And um, there's a joke somewhere I wrote down. I, I don't remember where, but it's like, yeah. it, it, if there's a hill with, like, a rock on it, there's probably a dwarf living inside that rock. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, because <laughs> the dwarves they they love their mountains, they love their hills, and it's like, hmm, that's a big rock. I bet I could fill. Uh, I could. I bet I could fit a house in there. I bet there's resources in there that I really want. Yes, yes. Uh, and at this at this t uh, point in time, the dwarves are led by their ancestor gods, and I'm not gonna go into detail about those, but imagine them as they're like demigods, I suppose. They are dwarfs, but they're like really powerful dwarfs. Um, whether they were created directly by the old ones or kind of just like got the power through rituals or whatever the heck it was, it's not quite clear, or at least I'm not going to go into detail with it right now. Um, but they're led by their ancestor gods right now. Um, moving on, about 500 years. Um, something, something happens. Again. Uh, this is just oh, a map no. here. Oh um, no, what's happened now? Something something bad happens again. Um, knock knock. Who's there this time? Chaos. Again. Demons of chaos, baby. <laughs> <laughs> the chaos well, invasion like begins like... anew in the year four thousand five hundred. And the world's um, Bilbo Baggins, and every time someone knocks on the door, it's like nobody's home. <laughs> yeah. You're not getting in. <laughs> Uh, that's an excellent reference. But unfortunately, yeah. people keep on storming through. Oh my god. Alright, so Chaos. Chaos is back. And the elves are full-on Tobey Maguire crying right now. They, many of them, still live with, like, PTSD of the, the previous war. And many of them just straight up go into depression. Like, I'm never going to be able to finish my poetry. Or, <laughs> or I'm not going to be able to read my book. And, and they just, like, many of them just basically give up on life. And, and they're like, yeah, let's just, you know what, if, if this is how it's going to be, I'd rather just die. So, that makes me wonder, then, you might be leading into this, but does that, um, since they've already managed to banish Chaos once, um, are they not able to do that again, or was there consequences from their previous attempt? I assume, I'm, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, with the last ritual. I didn't read into super detail about it, but I just assumed that the only reason that ritual worked was because the Lizardmen also added their power to the ritual. Yeah. And I'm not sure if they're, like, willing to take that risk again or if they, like, they lost the knowledge on how to do it. Um, also, quite clear that this that was only a temporary solution because, you know, chaos came back. Yeah, but you could banish them again and be like, all right, all right we got to prepare this time. <laughs> Yeah, true. Uh, I assume that, like, the ritual they did was just kind of, like, a desperate... They didn't really plan it out or anything. They just kind of did it uh, on yeah. a whim. And they're not really sure how to do it again. Yeah, I wasn't also too sure if it maybe it consumed a bunch of the magic in the world. And maybe Chaos had eaten too much or consumed too much as well. It's not described, but, like, perhaps. So it's always good. That's where that's where we get to have the fun, though, as... Um, Absolutely. just create things that we... Or ideas of how we think it would happen to explain it. What do you think? What, what, what do you think was the reason they lost it then? Well, I was assuming that maybe it, it, they lost some of their magic creating it. So maybe they were more powerful in the past and doing it once. They're not able to repeat that because they don't have the same power and ability. And possibly, as you said, that they obviously had the assistance of others who aren't aware or aren't willing to support them this time. Right. Okay. I kind of like to assume that the way they're described right now, they just, like, lost all interest in magic. <laughs> or not all interest, but, like, most of them were just like, nah, I'd rather read a book before I get killed by chaos demons. <laughs> I'd rather like, write oh. my poetry and make smooth silvery ivory towers and stuff like that. Yeah, we almost died, so I'm going to really focus on the important things that I appreciate and enjoy instead of yeah. this... I could, I, I could imagine a lot of them also have PTSD and, like, probably couldn't, like, leave certain places because all they would see was their brothers and sisters and, like, uh, families, like, imagine them being stabbed by demons and, you know, whatever. Um, anyways, yeah. Uh, the elves, straight up, uh, Toby Maguire crying a lot. Really, they, they just don't want. They really don't want to. However, there is one... 
There is, <laughs> you remember the, the Skyrim trailer? Somewhat. Yeah. It's like, uh, the, the dragons uh, prophesied the end time, but there is one day fear. In their tongue, he is Doakin. Dragon blood, or dragonborn, or whatever it is to say. Um, there is one guy like that among the elves. Not dragonborn, but uh, there is one day fear, both chaos and the other elves. And his name is Anarian. Um, and Anarian, he kind of goes around spanking all the elves, like, get your shit together. We, we have we have an island to defend, okay? We're not so pathetic that we're just going to roll over and die. And he goes around spanking all the elves, getting, getting mustering armies. And he steps into um, the flame of um, the phoenix. What is it called? Wait, what was it called? Again, the sacred flame of Asurian. Uh, Anarian steps into the sacred flame of Asurian. I kept mixing those names up when I wrote my notes. Anarian is the guy. Assyrian is like the high god of the, the elves. Like the ultimate pantheon god of the elves. He's at the very top. Uh, right. This doesn't sound like it's going to be pleasant, I'll tell you that much. Anarian passes through the sacred flame of Assyrian, and he steps out the other side, having now received the blessings and powers of Assyrian. Uh, and he becomes the first phoenix king of the elves. And as the first as the first phoenix king, he sets out to kick demon ass. And boy, does he kick some demon ass. Wherever he goes, he wins. It's like, it's not a matter if is it going to be a win or a loss. It's always going to be a win. It's just how big of a win it's going to be. Um, Dude, does, he, does him and his army all have the, this sort of armor and gear? I'm not sure if this is exactly... I think this is fan art of Anarian. I, there's not really yeah. a lot of art on him. Um, there's a book cover from one book, and I think that's about all the official art that exists of Anarian. Um, but it is very much a like silvery, very hardcore armor. Well, it does look pretty badass there, and I, I love the blue on it. You know, it's a, yeah. a wee artistic thing. I just thought it was pretty cool. Um, but despite being an absolute chat and killing demons left, right, and center... He can only be so many places at once. True, true. Um, so while he is One winning, he, he, they are winning the battles, but they're still fighting a losing battle. It's just that they're extending it by, you know, a lot. Um, yeah. So that's the elf situation going on on, on Wolf One right now. Not great. The temple cities of the Lizardmen are also, once again, under siege. And again. most of them... <laughs> Most of them, once again, fall. However, there is uh, a few that stand. One of them is Hexodl. And Hexodl is protected by a slan of the second spawning. Um, you remember how I explained that the first spawning was like the most powerful? Yep. And then the second spawning are, you know, still really powerful, but slightly less. And then third spawning and fourth and so forth and so forth. Yeah, they just slowly lose. Yeah, yeah exactly. They kind of, they kind of, they're the still ones. really powerful, but they are like... Subni significantly less powerful as you go down the spawnings. Uh, anyways, Hexo Audel is being protected by our toad dude, <laughs> Mr. Oh, Lord yes. Master Mundi. Um, and <laughs> sorry, I just I always crack. They, they model his butt cheeks, despite you never seeing it because he's on his mobility scooter. I thought, hey, you gotta do that, like that. Be, <laughs> you cannot. And then the other thing, on his absolutely chunk of the stomach, there's those handprints. Mm -hmm. And I imagine those handprints are fairly small. So I imagine he has skinks, like, dip their hands in paint, and he's like, rub my belly. <laughs> and they're like, yes, Lord Masamundi, I'll rub your belly, sir. I reckon the old ones almost created these, or him and his, like, the fellow, what are they called again? A slob. The yeah, like, in their own image slightly and just, but, like, weaker. Um, so, I, I, I like, I think that? most people like to say that the old ones are space frogs because yep. these are space toads. Yep. Or magic toads. Um, so, yes, it, it, is, it, is, it is theorized that the old ones are reptilian in nature. But, again, they're not described exactly. It would make sense, though, if you're creating something with a purpose that is absolutely, and that, that's I think I think that's where a lot of it comes from. Like they created the old one, or they created the lizard men, and it would make sense that if that's their personal army, they would kind of create it in their own image. You're right. I can't stop staring at his butt, though. 
<laughs> Chunky butt cheeks. Anyways, uh, Master Mundi is protecting uh, Hexawaddle, which is one, one of the larger temple cities. Okay. Um, I, I never described what a temple city was, did I? Not directly, but there are your images coming up. Throughout. Right, okay. So a temple city isn't as much as like a, you know, it's not a city per se. It's more like, I don't know, uh, Machu Picchu kind of situation. Like big, 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 big pyramids and different ruins, not ruins at this point, but different temples and pillars and, and things like that. Um, with, with weird magic because, you know, Warhammer. Um, they basically serve as powerful conduits to cast magic from and, like, make strongholds. And he's protecting Hexoaddle. And he, he, uh, he's a Chad. I, I have to say it. Lord Master Mundi, much like Anarian, is an absolute Chad. Because he cast a protective ward around the entirety of Hexoaddle. I don't know how big it is, but I imagine it, like, it's, it's a good capital city size, you know? Um... And he cast a ward around that whole thing and keeps the demons away and hopes them out. However, while he's casting his magic, you know, the Slan are really in tune with the magic of the world. And he can feel his brethren uh, die, like other Slan dying in different temple cities. And that's a big deal because Slan, they, they don't come back. Like, they, you, you don't spawn a new Slan. They're like, you know... Here's this number of Slan. When they're gone, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah. Um, I should have asked this at some point during... If you have any... Again, if you have questions, just interrupt me. Yeah, no, no. Okay. You're doing a good job. So, yeah. Uh, Master Mundi feels like a hundred... Like dozens, at least. I don't, I'm not exactly the number of Slan here, but he feels a lot of his Slan brothers dying, and, and things are not good. Another temple city, uh, the very first city of the Lizardmen, Itza, has been under siege for how long, do you think? 500 years. Very close. Four centuries. Nice. So four, 400 years. They've been, they, like, imagine being under siege for 400 years. It could never be taken over. Is, yes, but still, constant fighting for 400 years. That's, that's insane. No, 100% is. But at least they were designed for it. True, true. And um, one of the reasons why they've been able to hold on for so long is because they have uh, what is theorized to be the first slan of the first spawning uh, like as, as the leader of the city. And that is Absolute Lord Croak. OG. That, Sorry, that is Lord Croak. I'm not sure. Have you played the Lizardmen in Warhammer 2? Um, I played them a little bit into a Warhammer 2, but not um, tons. So you, you haven't gotten to the point where you can recruit uh, Lord Croak? Not that I remember. Yeah, so he's a hero in the game, and there's one, um, uh, one faction called... Um, well, it's called Itza. It's led by Gorok. He's like the White Saurus. Um, and he starts with uh, he starts with Croak in his um, in his army, and um, you could disband the entire army except for Croak and just like win the campaign more or less. Uh -huh. uh, he is very powerful in the game, and he's also very powerful in the lore. Uh, but what happens actually is that at some point he does tire out. Turns out fighting for four hundred years in a row, it, it does tire out even the most godlike beings. Um, and the demons break through and they climb up the big pyramid in the middle where Lord Krog is sitting on top and casting spells and doing, you know, shimmy shammer. Uh, and and they, they tear him to shreds. I don't have the quote here, but it's like, it's described as the, like, blood letters. They, those are the corn demons. Have you seen those? No. Oh, they're like, they're yeah, very, yeah, 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 I have seen them, yeah. Like, the best way I could describe them are, like, how most people would imagine demons, I guess. Big red, large head and horns. Um, right. Blood letters just jumping on him and ripping him to absolute freaking shreds. Like, dismantling his body. Uh, but Lord Croak is a chat. This is Lord Croak, by the way. Oh, let's see it. Uh, Lord Croak, despite dying, his spirit still lives. And he soars up above the uh, Itza, the first temple city of the Lizardmen. And he just fucking detonates like a, like a nuke. 
Like, not, not like a nuke, like a sun. It is described as if there were, for a moment, a second sun appeared above the city of Itza. And that bright light, after the bright light was finished, everything was still intact. But every single demon was gone. Talk about going out with a bang, eh? He straight up created, like, anti, anti-demon anti sun and just <laughs> deleted absolutely everything that had to do with chaos from Itza. And so, you know, with the death of Lord Croak, the siege of uh, Itza ended. It was a victory. It was a costly victory. But uh, it was it was a victory nonetheless. You've got to imagine there's one of the lizard men just being like, why could he have not done that 400 <laughs> fucking years ago? <laughs> true, Maybe true. Maybe 300. He's got, he's got to give him 100 years to try and uh, hold them off and then be like, all right, enough's enough. We've got, we got to drop it. I think the explanation is that when he left his mortal body, he became more like in tune with the magic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like he probably didn't know he could do that. Uh, he probably, he's like, he's dying, like, holy shit, wait, I can detonate an anti-demon nuke! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The coolest thing, I think, is that uh, Croak didn't die. Like, his physical oh, body his <laughs> physical body died. But um, the skinks that served Croak uh, gathered up his body parts that were ripped to shreds by the demons and kind of, like, stitched it back together <laughs> with a bunch of bandages. And uh, and his spirits now it now dwells within that like mummified corpse. Not too bad in the end, eh? No, so he is alive, but like he slumbers a lot. Like he has to be awoken, and and like he needs he needs some time to recharge his juices. I think. Yeah, more frequently. Yeah, um, but every once in a while he will wake up, and when he does wake up, like he he they they fuck Demon's shit up. Beard. They fuck shit up, right? Because uh, I do believe that, like, Aslan of the uh, the first spawning um, is, like, n- maybe not country-level powerful, like, but, but they could, like, they could easily, you know, take out an entire city. Yeah, for real. Uh, with their magic. Easily. Wow. We just saw him pretty much do his own spirit bomb, so... Yes, he did, yeah, he did the spirit bomb. <laughs> <laughs> raised his arms to the to the space or to space and said old ones give me your strength and then no one answered and he was like well I'll do it myself I guess um so is is he a, is he um in the weakened form in the Total Warhammer games or is he in his like OG badass no he is he is in his mummified form um wh- what you see on screen is basically his model in game he's, he's like skeleton fingers and like you know Skin that's yeah. like basically non-existent, like dried yeah, out, mummified, wrapped. Yeah, body. yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's how he looks in game. Nice. All right, back to the elves. Uh, we are now in the year four thousand four hundred and fifty. Uh, the second chaos invasion started around year uh four thousand five hundred. So it's been it's been like fifty years ish. Yeah, you can tell we're getting closer and closer to zero because. The numbers and the information, like the year counts again more and more detailed. Yes, and I'm also skipping over a lot of the unimportant details. We can cover the detail things more. Um, yeah, so sense. back to back back to the elves. Um, we we have Anarian still fighting, the off demons, doing a really good job. Uh, and along his fighting, he meets a woman, a, a female elf, of course, uh, named Morathi. And Morathi and Anarian uh, strike up a relationship. Now, it's a bit of a special relationship because n- neither of them loves each other. But they, like, they seek comfort, I suppose. So, like Anarian... somewhat. <laughs> yeah. Anarian... Uh, I, I want to go into... I want to do a full episode on Anirian because he deserves it. Um, but he's kind of described as when he's fighting, he's fighting. And when he's not fighting, he's thinking about fighting. He's not a very uh, talkative person uh, outside of war. And he is like very distant uh, emotionally. But when he's with Morathi, he just feels like at ease. Yeah. And Morathi is like... Uh, let me... Just, spoiler, she's a cunning bitch. Um... Uh, oh wait! I also forgot to say, uh, Morathi is also described as being like indescribably beautiful. 
Like the most beautiful elf, uh, may maybe ever. Nice. Um, I'm also yeah. wondering, looking at this photo, do you reckon in gaming terms our armor is better? <laughs> Absolutely. Like Anarian <laughs> plus fifty armor, Morathi plus one hundred and twenty. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's like uh, it has a special yeah, ability logic, where man. the the enemy can only aim for uh, her boobs or her shoulders, uh, <laughs> and the rest they they can't they can't aim for that. Uh, anyways, they strike up a relationship, and as I said, it's not a it's not a relationship of romance uh, or of uh, of marriage. It's just like they seek comfort with each other, and they they like, they feel at ease and and like good in each other's company. And um, <clears throat> uh, Morafi gets pregnant and bears a son, and that, that son be badass as fuck. That son is gonna be badass as fuck. He he he'll be named Malakif. Oh God! And yeah, that's a, that's his no future name. title will be the Witch King of Nagaroth, the hated enemy of the elves and leader of the Foul Druki. Uh, but for now, he's just a normal elf. For now. For now. Yes, but he was born in minus four thousand four hundred and fifty-eight. Okay, back to the war against chaos. Before you go to the War of Chaos, Alexander yes. was asking a question in chat. Oh, Ask sorry. I, I have not been paying attention to chat at all. Oh, so good. I got I'm you. so got sorry. You. Uh, Alexander asked if he is more hot or she, she's more hot than Alarial. I believe yeah. so. I'm fairly certain that like she is described as like the most beautiful elf ever. Absolutely. War of Chaos. The War of Chaos. Or did you also have a question? Sorry, franchise. No, no, no. That was it. Uh, moving on to uh, the next part of the War of Chaos. There is a great, great wizard called Kalidor Dragon Tamer, and he comes up with a plan to drain the excess magic of the world in a giant vortex to get rid of like the surplus of chaos. Because you remember what I said about the world being like oversaturated with magic, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the whole idea here is to drain the magic into this giant vortex and send it back to um, the realm of chaos where magic like comes from or whatever. Yep. And hopefully they'll follow after. Yes. So the idea is like demons will still exist, but they'll exist in a much, much lesser number and will not be able to form these giant invading armies as they have been doing now. Also wouldn't be as interested, I imagine, in the world without magic. Um, so with... no, that's not quite how it works. Like demons, they don't feed on... It's, it's a convoluted situation. Uh, they are still very interested in the world. It's just that they, they can't exist at the number they do without the amount of magic. Yep. Again, you got to remember that it's like the whole, you know, given flesh through magic. Yeah, they, are magical, they are magical beings, which means that they can't exist in great numbers without enough magic. Yeah, so they're almost like their sort of barrier, their source, not their... Yeah, I guess, I guess you could say that. Effort. Yeah, absolutely. Um... All right, so um, so Kalidor, he begins his ritual, and it takes one full year of casting magic, like the best of the best of the High Elves, casting magic and creating the Great Vortex. Uh, I don't exactly remember the number of uh, casters, but there's like, uh, I think there's like five or six or seven of them, uh, and these are like the best of the best, and they spend a full year, a full year casting magic and having to be protected while they do it. Uh, and they, but they succeed. They succeed in creating the vortex, the great vortex, on the Isle of the Dead, as it'll become to, or as it'll come to be known. Because not only did they take a year to cast the spell, they need to cast it for the rest of eternity. So inside the vortex, uh, you will see Kalidor Dragon Tamer and the rest of the Elven Mages in there keeping the ritual alive and draining the excess magic of the world for the rest of eternity. I'm assuming they're not going to be, once they've done their year casting, they don't have to be constantly ill, self-sustained. Uh, well, what do you mean? So obviously you said they took them a year to cast the Vortex and then they don't have to be continually casting after that for eternity itself. Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> So it's a, it's a year of planning the Vortex and making rituals and getting it ready. Oh, and, then, right. and, and then it's Eternity casting it. Yeah, that sounds like a um, crappy life, but I needed one. 
It is an absolutely crappy life. And and yeah, the the place that Vortex stands on is, is named the Isle of the Dead. Because, you know, dead men stand on it, keeping the world alive. Yep. Makes sense. Um, yeah. So yeah, the High Elves, they complete their great ritual. The demon legions are vanished from the world. The ones that are not vanished are defeated. And like, things are looking great again. Everyone from the the the, the, the racist lizardmen to the, um, well, everyone's racist in Warhammer, never mind. Uh, <laughs> everyone from the lizardmen to the dwarves, the humans, the elves, the orcs, every single person sits back in their gamer chair, takes a deep breath and a sigh of relief. Whew. Because that was, that was a lot of shit going down. In total, they have been fighting chaos on and off from the year five, minus 5,600 and until, let's see what's here, uh, 4,200. Nice. So that's a solid, you know, 1,300 years of fighting demons. You'd think they'd be good at it by the end. <laughs> Perhaps, but again, it's just like... Potentially. <laughs> Numbers upon numbers upon numbers, you know? Uh, but yeah, the, uh, the, the, the big chaos invasions are over. Everyone, everyone is, 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 doing, is doing better, at the very least. For a while. And um, what is the first thing the, the elves do? <laughs> fuck this shit, I'm out. A lot of them says, fuck this shit, I'm out. Um, they start forming colonies in the old world, which is where the Empire and Bretonia are. Uh, and they seek out to do that. Um, I, I'd have to read up more on it, uh, but they basically like just they leave Ulfuan, and I imagine it's a mix of wanting to you know explore the world now that there's finally peace. But I also think it's it's kind of the situation of we can't be on Ulfuan anymore. We've seen too many horrible things happen here. We just need to be somewhere else. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. You wouldn't want to really live there after. No, I, I could just, like, just imagine, like, all the people you've known, uh, you, you just seen them been slaughtered, and every time you go there, you just see that, you know, image in your head. Um, so yeah, they, uh, they start colonizing different places in the, the old world, and they will later become known as the Wood Elves. Nice. So that's, I'm not gonna say any more than that, I just wanted to mention, like, these... Old world colonies. Some of them uh, live and die. Uh, the ones that live turn. Most of them turn to be become uh, wood elves. Um, also, I think you're going to touch on them in a future episode. Yes, I imagine I'll do a wood elves episode later on. Um, also, we're now in year three thousand nine hundred and ninety-seven to be specific. Um. And uh, Anarian, by the way, after the war with the demons, Anarian just kind of said, poof, like, sayonara, peace out. He just disappeared. Just went to chill in a, in a lodge, looking out on the sunrise. Ah, <laughs> on a grateful universe. Um, <laughs> yeah, he kind of just peaced out. Uh, no one quite knew what happened with him. Not Morathi, not Malakith. No one else, like, knew what, what the hell happened. Um... But the, uh, but the elves uh, took to themselves, in like honor of Anarian, they would keep on uh, having a phoenix king, a leader. And, you know, by birthright, it should be Malekith. However, Malekith was not chosen. Why he was not chosen is something we'll also have to discuss in a, like, a Malekith episode or whatever. Um, but he was not chosen. Instead, uh, another high elf uh, noble named Belshanar was chosen to be the uh, the Phoenix King, the second Phoenix King. And what do you think Malekith did? Um, went to war, I imagine? Over no, 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 no. Malekith was like, you know what? That's completely fair. As long as everyone agrees this is what we should do, I agree as well. And Belshanar became the second Phoenix King. And Malekith and Belshanar was actually pretty good bros. Nice. They were like pretty good friends, and uh, Belshanar named Malekith like High War Master, Leader, General, Commander, whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and Malekith took control of the army, and he started setting out to different places of the world. I, I again, not, haven't read up on why he did this. Uh, it could be like world exploration, or like 
uh, trying to uh, expand the Elven Empire. I don't exactly know. But he starts traveling around the world, and he actually makes, quite interesting, a, not a lot of friends. Uh, one of the friends he makes is uh, the High King of the Dwarfs, which is called Snorri Whitebeard, which is just like the most dwarf name ever. <laughs> um, Snorri Wh Whitebeard and Malekith team up against a horde of beastmen. Uh, you know Beastmen from Warhammer 2 as well, I assume. Yes. Um, and quick introduction to the Beastmen. Um, it's not quite clear how they were created, but they are like an offspring of the Chaos Invasion. I think it is described as when the Polar Warp Gates destroyed and like, you know, overflowed the world with magic. Some places had it worse than others. And in those places where primitive humans were living with their stock animals, they kind of like mutated together. And became the Beastmen. Better From, than finding comfort in the animals. <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally inside the animals. They are the animals now. Yeah. Yeah. Or um, mutated form of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but Malekith and uh, Snorri Whitebeard, they, uh, they team up and defeat this large horde of Beastmen that besiege Karas Akarak, which is like the main... Uh, dwarven capital city also in the game not sure if you've noticed not that I remember uh, no but it's like there's there's four different factions that all have like the end goal of uh, besiege or controlling Karasa Karak so it's like it's a big deal nice um, right and, and, and Malkith he strikes up you know also a good friendship with uh, the dwarves in general they like trade trade uh, thoughts and, and, and secrets and like how to do things uh, the dwarves are obviously really good at uh, smithing and building and the elves are also quite good at building but like they, they, they trade different things between each other and, and, and teach each other a lot of things and, and for once in a fantasy setting the elves and the dwarves are actually friends Sure, Legolas and Gimli will be happy to hear that. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, they're only friends for so long. But that's well, going to be in a different episode. Uh, <laughs> at least for uh, a time. And yeah, and yeah Malekith, again, he um, kind of kind of not a, not a bad guy yet. Uh, but not too long after this, um, he goes to the Chaos Wastes in search of artifacts uh, to, like strengthen the elven empire and he finds uh something called the circlet of iron and let's just say oh, that, that is the beginning of uh that is the beginning of malekith's downfall uh is when he finds this circlet of iron uh but yep. again we'll leave that for a different episode yeah that makes that sounds like it'd have a a long story following it absolutely absolutely uh we are at the very end by the way so don't worry not not long enough not long to go now um, one thing I might have mentioned, but maybe I didn't, is that some dwarves also settled the Darklands, which is this part between the World Edge Mountains and uh, Cathay. Uh, and the Darklands were one of those places that got it real bad during the uh, collapse of the Warp Gates. And these uh, dwarves, they turned to uh, a god called Hashut. And Hashut, besides sounding like uh, something you put on your feet, like I'm just going to put on my Hashuts, um, they, uh, he's, a, he's a demon. He's like an arc demon. Are you aware of the like four main de uh, chaos gods? I am not, no. Okay. Um, so there's Korn, Nurgle, Slanesh, and Sneech. Uh, right. Or Sneech. Sne I keep forgetting how his name's pronounced. Anyway. Is Korn uh, a god or I thought that was like a species of demon? Or no, is uh, Korn is a chaos god. And it's like Korn's army. Yes, exactly. So the, the red demons, the blood letters we talked about earlier that ripped yeah. uh, Lord Croak to shreds, those yeah, are yeah. demons of Korn. Um, right, but, but so let, let's say in the realm of chaos, the four chaos gods, they take up like a solid, let's just say 98% of the realm. Mm -hmm. um, but the last 2% are left over for like independent demons that don't work specifically under any of the other demons. Contractors. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Freelancers. Um, and Hashud is the father of darkness, the god of fire, greed, and tyranny. And some dwarves were like, hey, fire and greed. That, and, and darkness. We live in mountains. We like gold. 
that you know we 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 smite things or smith smithing things whatever um, we don't like giving it to others yeah like that sounds like our guy and they start worshiping him and they become the monstrosities known as chaos dwarfs and 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 uh, Mr. Uh, noses. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Lister Blister, uh, I'm sure you're aware of him, but to anyone else who don't know who it is, uh, another streamer, um, I've already agreed to come on the podcast, but I have to do an episode on Chaos Dwarfs. Fair. So I just quickly wanted to introduce them here. Uh, and from my understanding, still limited knowledge of the uh, Chaos Dwarfs, they're basically normal dwarfs, but just like, you know, turned up to to 11 in terms of greed evilness and like that when 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 normal dwarves build the catapult they build a hell cannon <laughs> you know that kind of thing yeah, yeah yeah um and uh and with that we have covered eleven thousand years of warhammer now nice. there is still quite a lot but i feel like each of those topics deserve like its own episode because we have the downfall of Malekith, which leads into the Elven Civil War and the Sundering. Um, we have the rise of, uh, of Nagash. And we also have, like, uh, the War of the Beard and, and uh, Setra and a bunch of other really important characters. Um, that I, I don't feel like they, they can just be mentioned and be skimmed over. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I feel they, they should get their own episode. Yeah, nice. Clearly got lots to to still to be discussed. This is just creating the foundations of where it might fit in, where it might lead to, or things to be discussed. And it's just a good point, maybe how it also interacts with all the other races and the timeline. Yeah. So what are the sort of next episodes you've got coming up and the topics they're going to be covering? Imagine so the next episode planned. is most likely going to be the uh, Elven Civil War and the Sundering, uh, which are like also major events that happen before year zero. Yeah, so what sort of time do they sort of occur? Uh, basically right now where we left off. Nice. So it's kind of like sort of next. In it's kind of like the natural next zero. step to talk about. Um, do you want to talk more about the sword? Oh, the sword of Cain. Okay, so Anarian wielded uh, wielded a very very powerful sword while he was fighting the demons. Okay. Uh, and that that sword is known as the sword of Cain, and the sword of Cain grants whoever uses it like unimaginable power, but it also corrupts their mind. Um, so the sword of the Cain is the elven god of like murder, and you know the sword of Cain. So. It's like Cain slowly takes over your mind as you use the sword, and all you think about is murder and war, which is also part of why uh, Anarian was such a beast as he was, uh, yeah. but but also why he couldn't really think about anything other than war, and also probably why he left, like he peaced out because he was like he was so corrupted by the sword. All right, hopefully self-aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a good shout, Darkness, um, to like uh, mention that real quick. Um, right, Franchise, where can people find you? Yeah, I'm Franchise. I usually um, stream on Twitch. I'm usually a bit of a action, adventure, gamer, dabble in some From Software and Dark Souls-like games. And yeah, and just generally just trying to consume as much different gaming as I can. I've not really stick to one thing too much. I quite like to experience a variety of different games, which I also then cover in my, um, my TikToks, which I like to do short little videos on moments, um, sort of levels in games and hopefully it's 2022 is going to be an exciting year for gaming there's a phenomenal number of games coming out hopefully not too many of them will get delayed into 2023 but even if they do there's going to be so much going on that it might end up helping not create too much of a backlog so yeah i just like talking about gaming and tvs and movies so if you're always interested in bouncing that off someone especially some marvel and star wars then always hit me up all right, and that is Franchise 1140 on all those platforms, correct? Correct. Correct. All right, well, Franchise, with that, I just want to say thank you so much for joining me. And, uh, and, and uh, oh, yeah, congratulations on, uh, you know, uh, the proposal and, uh, and all that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ended 2021 on a bang. Yes. Hopefully 2022 will not be 2022. You know, because like part two of 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got it, yeah, I got it, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Anyways, uh, thank you so much for joining me, Franchise. Thank you to everyone uh, watching this. If you didn't catch the entirety of the podcast, 
I will be uploading it to my YouTube channel. There's gonna be a link in chat now. And if you're watching this on YouTube, then I know, thank you for watching. You can watch it live whenever it happens over on the Twitch channel. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Franchise, and I'll just see you uh, next time.